Good morning and welcome back to another video. We are back from Japan, so it's time to jump back into the build content. As you can see by the title of the video, we are slapping a turbo on God's engine, the 1GFE, in my Lexus IS200. This video is a little bit scrambled as I was doing it over a few days after work. However, I've tried to film it in a step-by-step -step type of format, so it's both informative and hopefully entertaining to watch. First things first, let's get this thing on the dyno NA and see how much it makes. Final numbers in, 118. As you can see, NA, we made a whopping 118 horsepower or 88 kilowatts. That's not a whole lot, so let's change that. First things first, let's get the NA hot side off and the turbo hot side and straight pipe on. the next day and it's time to move on to the fun stuff. As you saw yesterday, we took the NA hot side off. So step one is going to be probably the most aesthetically pleasing part, which is putting the new turbo hot side on along with the new secondhand sump, which has already had pre-drilled and installed a turbo oil return fitting. Turbo hot side on, it's time to talk about fluid supply to the turbo. When dealing with turbochargers, you have to deal with usually one or two different fluids. They are oil and coolant. In my case, I'll be running oil only on this turbo. And so where will I be pulling that from? Well, on the 1GFE, they have a factory high pressure oil feed to the VVTI solenoid at the front of the rock cover here. I have this replacement banjo bolt fitting with a little little filter for the VVTI solenoid on the end that adapts to a Dash 4AN fitting, which will go to my Dash 4AN line, which supplies the turbocharger. So essentially, I'll put this banjo bolt in as a replacement for the factory one, and I'll be piggybacking off the high pressure oil supply so I can supply the turbo with oil while maintaining the factory use of the VVTI solenoid. Not that it feels like it does much anyway, but that's how that works. And obviously the oil return just goes straight to the bulkhead fitting in the sump. And just like that we have oil supply to the turbo. Alright, with the turbo oil feed sorted, we need to sort out the return. My kit comes with a new secondhand sump that has a brass bulkhead fitting already in it. You could do this a couple different ways and drill your sump already on the car, however you kind of risk getting some metal shavings and everything in there. Considering I have the sump already with a fitting, I'm just going to swap over to the new sump. I had to drop the subframe and raise the engine up on two stands and get the front sway bar out of the way so the sump clears the oil pickup. That's the old one out, time to put the new one in. All right, the turbo sump is clean and ready to go in. If you want your car to not have oil leaks, clean everything thoroughly. Clean, clean, clean. I've gone over the block and the new sump with some Scotch-Brite and brake clean, but make sure you wipe it down and really get all the oily remnants off or it will leak and oil leaks suck and they stink and your car shouldn't have oil leaks. This will divide a few people doing the uh, smear technique, but I think it stops him from leaving too much on the sump. With the sump and oil return sorted, it's time to move on to the exhaust and intercooler setup. The setup I have is just a full straight pipe mild steel setup and a front mount intercooler with way too many silicon joiners. They're a little rough, but they do the job and it's just to get me by until I can make some new stuff later in the year. So let's pop them on. As 
As you saw, I made these plates on the CNC plasma. They match the bolt pattern of the factory crash bar, bolted them onto the end of the rail and welded my own bar to it. This allowed me to position the inner cooler exactly where I wanted it, a lot easier than cutting up the factory crash bar. At the top, inner cooler is mounted to the bar with a socket head gap screw and some dash six hard line. Come down the bottom and I've got the inner cooler fastened to the lower rad support using some nut certs and some alley L brackets. Now I know this isn't the prettiest setup, especially where it goes into the throttle body, but it is only temporary to get me by until I can make something way nicer. So now that I got the charge system hooked up, let's move on to the fuel system. First thing to upgrade in the fuel system will be the fuel pump. In the IS200, it's located under the back seat, under this little cover here. Undo all those little eight mils and the factory fuel line and connector and the whole assembly comes out. With the bottom section off the top hat here, we can see the fuel pump. This is a Warbro 255. Uh, Lexus forums would say that the factory fuel pump is 108 to 160 liters per hour. I couldn't find anything incredibly accurate, but point being, that's not enough considering I want to run this car on E85. In this bottom housing here, you'd normally see an encapsulated paper filter in a hard plastic housing, as well as some extra stuff on the outside, which, which has been ground down to provide clearance for the fuel pump and some extra components. I kept it simple by wiring the Warbro into the factory connector on the bottom of the top hat, meaning I could keep the plug up top. I simply added a relay down near the fuse box for the Haltech to trigger and had the output from the relay go to the factory plug on the top hat. This isn't a huge upgrade, so the factory wiring is more than capable of keeping up with the amperage draw of the new pump. Paying attention to the top hat, you can see I've added two AM bulkheads with Teflon washers. This is because from factory, the IS200 comes with a returnless constant pressure fuel system and this won't cut it for our new turbo setup. I simply drilled out larger holes to suit the new fittings and added some fuel safe sealant on the bottom of the washers to ensure an airtight seal. With the new pump and modified hanger back in the car, we have to get the fuel from the tank to the engine. So I've got these two dash six fittings coming off our new bulkheads and some 516s fuel hose. This is the feed, this is the return. This just adapts to the factory hard line with an inline filter now. And the return line runs alongside the factory feed coming from the new rising rate fuel pressure reg in the bay. So now we have fuel up to the rail and we need to get it into the engine. So let's talk injectors. Now my kit did come with some used injectors. However, unfortunately for me, they were all seized and I ended up grabbing a set of 627cc genuine Bosch injectors from Golby's Parts. These injectors fit into the head really well. However, you do need to run a little adapter to get them to fit into the OEM rail. And as you can see up here for the return, I have a metric 2-6 adapter and this dash 6 right angle line, which just runs some fuel hose to the new TurboSmart FPR6 and then out of the FPR6 and back to the tank. Now, probably the messiest and one of the last things on the list is wiring and engine management. So to run the engine, you can see I've got myself a Haltech Sprint 500 and you can actually see we've got two ECUs in the engine bay. This is the OEM ECU and then we've got the Haltech. This is because the Haltech is wired in as a piggyback setup. The piggyback setup works by having the Haltech hijack the cranking cam sensors to control the ignition and injection systems as well as VVTI. It also tees into some basic sensors like TPS with the addition of an intake air temperature sensor now in the charge pipe before the throttle body. Doing this and keeping the OEM ECU allows us to retain use of the chassis integration, meaning all our dash, gauges and sensors, AC controls, etc. still work and display data. The Haltech also has an onboard map sensor to read positive boost pressure, so there is no need to wire in an external map sensor. So we're all wired up and almost ready for the dyno. And as well as this setup does work, it looks rough. I'm not proud of how the bay looks at all, but the entire point of this car was for it to be a cheap to run budget build. I am in this turbo setup around the 2000 Australian dollar mark for everything. And I'm not very much into the car either. So it works fantastic, but it looks rough and it won't be staying like this. I've already got a million ideas to clean up the engine bay. But for now, this setup just works great. With that all said and done, let's move on to the last thing before we hit the dyno changing out the clutch. be asking yourself what can the stock clutch take and is it worth upgrading? I have no idea what the stock clutch can take, but here are two reasons why it's worth upgrading. If we pay attention to the centerpiece of the stock clutch disc here, we can see that OE used two little metal shims and a rubber bushing as the torsional dampers. If you don't know what these are used for, basically they are to take up the torsional vibration that is caused when engaging or disengaging the clutch. And what's wrong with these ones, they might work perfectly in a slow power and 
drive it to the shops application. However, using it in a more applica aggressive application like drifting, such as I will be, these two little shims can actually pop out, which will then shoot the rubber bushing out and wreak havoc spinning around a million miles an hour in your clutch assembly. If we head over to the heavy duty Exidy, you'll see that instead of two little shims and a rubber bushing, we have a more traditional spring stack, which is way less likely to come out under clutch kick and aggressive conditions. The second issue being that Toyota use what is called a dual mass flywheel from the factory, which is two separate pieces of metal joined together with a diaphragm. And it works in the same respect that a clutch diaphragm spring does and achieves the same goal of dampening any torsional vibration going through the drivetrain. However, it is a consumable and it does wear out, which does cause the two separate discs to turn independently of each other and cause a rattling as the engine's rotating around. Or in extreme cases, those two pieces can actually come completely apart and that's never good. But if we jump over to the Exidy Heavy Duty, we can see that the flywheel is one singular piece, making it a single mass flywheel and is much more appropriate. Unlike a dual mass flywheel, these are a serviceable item. So when the friction surface gets worn, you can simply machine it and put it back on rather than having to replace the entire flywheel, which is much cheaper because these are very expensive. But with that all said and done, I'm gonna speed run the box back in the car. the clutch works and we are dyno ready. Just gotta hook everything up and then I'll run through a couple of things. timing is simply syncing the engine ECU with the engine so that the ignition figures, the ignition advance figures that are in the base ignition table are what the engine is actually seeing. To do so on this Altec Platinum, I've just opened the main setup menu, come over to the ignition tab and I'm gonna put the ignition lock to enabled and set the lock timing value to a value that's on the front timing cover. Once you've confirmed the ignition value that you're seeing at the crank pulley is the same as what you've entered in the table, you can disable lock mode, apply and continue tuning. We're going to start off by doing some steady state tuning and making sure that the fueling's correct, then we'll move on to some power runs and see what we can make. Welcome to the voiceover. I got a lot of positive feedback when I was a little bit more technical in my engine building video, so I thought I would do the same here while I'm on the dyno. The first thing you see me do is run the car through a couple of gears and load the engine up at a set RPM. The dyno is capable of putting load on the rear wheels, which means it can hold the engine at a steady RPM reading that the user sets, regardless of throttle input. This is called steady state tuning. This means that the user, in this case myself, am able to sweep through the load axis from vacuum to boost at each RPM cell in the fuel map and fully and accurately tune the air fuel ratio before moving on to ramp runs, dialing in some timing and chasing power. It's important to note that I've set the timing map to very safe values while doing this and you'll see in the coming clips just how big a difference a few degrees makes to the total power output of an engine. The headphones you see me wearing are what's called knock ears and they allow me to listen to the engine and monitor for any knock events that may occur when tuning. Once I was done with steady state tuning, and happy with the air fuel mixture, I was able to move on to the fun bit that everyone cares about, which is ramp runs and chasing power. Alright, time for a ramp run. Apologies if the footage is a little bit shitty, my good camera's gone flat, but I've just finished doing a bunch of steady state tuning on the Lexus and done the first ramp run. We are the yellow line and right off the rip we've made 169.9 horsepower, peaking at around 9 pounds of boost and falling off to about 7 by the end of it. Just done another 
of two power runs and on that last one I've added two degrees and picked up. I've gone from 169 to 181 so I'm just going to throw another two degrees at it and see if it loves it. After dialing in some more timing and doing a couple more ramp runs, I was able to consistently make a 201 to 203 horsepower. I'll wrap it up here as I don't want to go too over the top and sound boring, but if you have any questions, leave a comment below and I'm happy to answer all comments. If you enjoyed this voiceover and you want to learn more technical stuff like this, stay to the end of the video and I will link you to a fantastic learning platform that has taught myself and so many others a great deal about tuning and a whole lot more. Hope you enjoyed the voiceover. Thank you so much for listening. Let's get the car off the dyno and go for a test. Alright, and that's a wrap for the first Turbo Swap IS200 video. I hope you enjoyed the voiceovers and some of the more technical aspects of the video. If you do love the technical stuff, I highly recommend checking out HPA High Performance Academy. They're an online performance-based school and they have courses on everything you need to know to build a car from the ground up, all the way from engine building, wiring, tuning, and so much more. I'm not sponsored by them at all. I just love what they do for the community. There's so much misinformation out there and they alleviate all the stress of finding out what's fact and what's fiction. I've taken multiple of their courses and they're the reason I know how to tune so huge shout out to hpa they're awesome if you love the technical technical stuff i highly recommend going and checking out their online school not meaning for this to sound like an ad but honestly the resource they provide is so valuable but that being said and done thank you so much for watching the video i hope you enjoyed it and stay tuned for more lexus updates i've got so much more planned for this thing including more power yeah that's gonna be it thanks so much for watching i'll see you in the next one